Great. Well, good evening. My name is Nairi Woods, and I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you here this evening for a discussion of one of my colleagues' latest books, Making Sense of Corruption. So here tonight to present the book, we have Professor Boo Rothstein, sitting here on the left, who's a professor here in the Blavatnik School. Um, we have his co-author, Aisha Varak, from the University of Gothenburg. They will present for five minutes each, I think, just to give you a sense and a flavor of the findings of their research on making sense of corruption. And then I'm delighted that we have two practitioner commentators on this work. So first, Professor Atihiru Jega, who is the Africa Initiative for Governance visiting fellow here at the school uh, this year. We've been delighted to have Professor Jega, who was the electoral commissioner in Nigeria and singularly successful in handing a successful electoral changeover in Nigeria in the last presidential election. And then Last but certainly not least, a great supporter of the school, Mohamed Amursi, who has worked for many years um, and both as a legal advisor and general advisor to both governments and private sector companies, particularly across Africa, but also in other parts of the world, and has acquired a deep sense of the practical problem of corruption up close and has a commitment to combating corruption. So we're delighted to have the four of you and without further ado, can I t turn to Boo to start the presentation and assure you all that once the, the book's findings have been presented and we've had comments from our two commentators, then you will get to ask your questions and we will finish the session in approximately an hour's time. Thank you very much. Thank you. I need something to change the pictures. Here we are. Ah, good, thank you. I think you'll find the arrows Thank you, Nairi, for this introduction. Thanks for coming. Uh, yes, um, when you publish a book, you must have a rationale why you have done this and done all this work. And uh, one is uh, a quote from one of the really big names in um, corruption research. His name is Paul Haywood. He is the editor of the Handbook of Political Corruption that was produced about one and a half year ago, right? And this is what Professor Haywood is saying. There remains a striking lack of scholarly agreement over even the most basic questions about corruption. Amongst the core issues that continue to generate disputes are the very definition of corruption as a concept. And this is, of course, a little problematic, especially since both in the media and in the scholarly community, the interest in corruption has exploded during the last 15 years, as it can be measured. Uh, and why is this in problematic? Well, one problem that we illustrate in the book is that we are not at all happy with the standard definition of corruption that is used. It's some variation of this abuse of public power for private gain. And as you all can see, this is an empty definition because abuse is not defined, so it's an empty signifier. You cannot have it for anything. And this means that corruption in Estonia would be something completely different than corruption in Peru, right? And then we cannot have any comparative measures and we are lost. Now, why is this important? Let me introduce one of the masters of political science. He's now 92 years old. He is most famous for his conceptual and methodological contribution, Giovanni Sartori, Italian, but has worked in the United States for most of his life. And this is my favorite quote from him. He says, concept formation stands prior to quantification. Before measuring, you must know what it is you measure. Right. Uh, and this is very much a book about conceptual precision, but I'm basically a measurement freak, as my colleague, our colleague, Søren Holmberg at the University of Gothenburg says, if you can measure, if you can compete in figure skating in the Olympics, you can measure everything. So without conceptual precision, there is no valid measures. Without valid measures, there is no explanation for the variation that we can see 
in corruption and without this we cannot find any explanation and if we cannot find any explanation there is no cure how have we done this first and as Aisha will explain after me by relating the concept to its many cousins there are dozens of cousins to corruption and also by doing what in military terms is known as an encircling maneuver so you don't hit the enemy right on you go around so what we've done is to try to see what is the opposite of corruption what state of affairs are we interested in reaching when we can say here we have some control over corruption there could of course not be a corruption free country that would be as likely as a crime free country but still you can uh, uh, see variations in in the level here and we ask is there a basic norm for how public officials should behave when they exercise public power and we think there is uh, we put our money on this idea of impartiality we think it works as a basic norm and you can also say this means that favoritism is the opposite to justice and corruption is at the heart and that is one of our argument it's actually a question about justice so what is new and what is controversial in this book you can ask we argue actually that for the existence of a universal understanding of corruption over time and space people in sub-saharan countries or very corrupt countries in latin america or asia do not have actually different moral understanding of corruption than people in Denmark. And we also argue that this is also over time. When we read uh, anti-corruption campaigns from 12th century France, they seem extremely modern. They could be written today. And we also say that people in highly corrupt settings, they do not internalize corruption in their moral space. Corruption campaigns, yes, as I just mentioned, they are very modern. So we also have worked with uh, anthropologists, and we can show that uh, societies, tribal hunter-gatherer societies, actually identify corruption. And why? we use this public good approach every society no matter how small it is a tribe has to produce some public goods water taking care of orphans security and what people all over the world seem to define as corruption is that when those who are set to manage the public goods transform them into their private goods over to Asha thank you Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just like Boo mentioned, we relate corruption to m many of its cousins, and just to name a few, we have clientelism, patronage, state capture, all of these. So before I elaborate on how we got to that, when we were researching and reading around in the literature, we realized that we had to take a step back. We had to first real realize and decide on what kind of a level of concept as corruption and we understand it as a higher level concept where only when we look at it as an umbrella concept can we see that in and of itself all these cousins share corruption between themselves and what we do is we borrow from taking a very interdisciplinary approach we borrow from Ludwig Wittgenstein and use his family resemblance idea it's similar to the classification system in biology where you have genus, family, species, etc. And uh, why we use this? Well, because it really helps acknowledge the fluidity of concepts and the fact that concepts can overlap, but they can still exist in their own right. And once we arrived at that, we could once again return to our hunt for the core of corruption. And the pieces started falling into place. So I've spent the last 10 days at a winter school right now where we were looking at elections and uh, vote choice. And my main feedback every single time was, how does this translate to the developing context? I look at a developing country, so for me, that's imperative. I think as researchers and scholars, we have a tendency to dig deep 
into what we're doing. And sometimes we get tunnel vision and we forget about what's happening in the rest of it. So Islamic political theory, why do we bring this in? We felt that it's important for us to look at other civilizations as well. Ruling elites have existed forever. And uh, government problems must have also been similar across these different places. How have they handled that? We wanted to know that more. So we stepped back a thousand years and looked at Ibn Khaldun, this gentleman in the turban, towards also the more modern Sayyid Hussein al -Atas. And what do they offer? How do they, what kind of similarities actually exist? What kind of problems? Well, the overarching problem we noticed and see similarity we see is that corruption seems to be one of the governance problems. Whether it's found in Machiavelli's The Prince, or if it's found in an advice letter written by a general to his son taking over an empire. And over and over again, what we saw over there is that the core that they point to is justice. I, this might be a controversial example I'm about to say, but in the Indian subcontinent, the one thing, the positive legacy, if there is any, of colonialism is, in Urdu they say, Gora in saf de tata. And that is, the British gave us justice. That is still remembered in the Indian subcontinent today. And so that's one overarching picture we have. The second thing we have is the direction of corruption. Where does it start? In Chinese, there's a proverb, the, rich, the fish rots from the head down. And Ibn Khaldun and the Islamic political theory, just like we see in the literature today, they talk about the direction of corruption going from above down. Sarah Chase talks a lot about this in her study on Afghanistan. And then coming now that we've started narrowing in on what is the core of corruption. The black hole that we noticed in the literature was, wait a minute, justice, corruption is linked to justice. What's the other concept we see constantly that we can relate to, every one of us? What is intrinsic to being human? The human rights campaign that started back in the 40s after World War II. That's something that actually links corruption to human rights, justice. So they share the same conceptual space and the same core. And what we've been wondering over and over again is, will there ever be a time where people start demanding corruption, a corruption-free society as an intrinsic right, like they do for human rights? Thank you. Excellent. Can I ask the audience, were there any things that you, any immediate things that you wanted clarified before we move to the respondents? So none, crystal clear. Thank you to the two <laughs> presenters. <laughs> Professor Jager. Thank you. Um, I have been privileged to have an advanced copy of the book. Thank you to mm. Professor Rosten, and I have uh, had time to read it. And I would like to first of all congratulate the authors. I think it's a very commendable work on the topic of making sense uh, of corruption. I consider it as an excellent exposition uh, of issues associated with the question of corruption theoretically and uh, methodologically. Uh, okay, uh, I've lost my classroom voice, but I'll try to... <laughs> Um, I consider this as an excellent uh, exposition, as I said, uh, uh, on the issue of corruption methodologically and uh, uh, theoretically. Uh, I think uh, it's an easy read. Uh, it tells the story. Uh, uh, I think they found the voice in terms of expressing the ideas. Um, but it is also thought-provoking. And uh, my contribution is on two issues that really struck me uh, in reading uh, this book. Uh, first of all, um, there is the issue of uh, let me first of all uh, preface my contribution by saying that coming from Nigeria, uh, where I have been preoccupied with not only the study of the brand of Nigerian soft state, but also advocacy and even involvement in struggles in bringing about reforms and positive changes, including 
on the question of uh, elections, uh, I found some of these uh, issues that have been raised in the book worthy of serious contemplation, and that's what I found uh, uh, thought-provoking. And there are two issues I want to uh, uh, talk about. Uh, the first issue relates to the larger issue of democratization and governance. And uh, they, are, they raised a very important question of what deserves more attention. Is it the taming of the beast? I think that's the word that they have used. On, in, the, in, in, in other words, how to access uh, power or how the access to power is organized. Or is what is important what the animal can achieve? And that relates, I think, the important questions they addressed with regards to how power is exercised and the questions of the quality uh, of uh, governance. And in addressing this issue, what struck me uh, is that a consideration of the context is probably of great uh, significance. And I say this because it appears to me that in the context of Western developed countries, it may well be that the beast has been tamed at least sufficiently and satisfactorily to shift attention to the question of what can it achieve. Uh, whereas in the third world, and certainly in a country like Nigeria, the beast is still very wild. And uh, efforts to tame the beast uh, obviously assume primacy, uh, in my view. And this is where I think that uh, what is important is in terms of the processes of deepening democracy, the processes of electoral integrity, through which you can have good quality representatives who can come into governance and who can not only conduct the affairs of the state with integrity, but would also be able to derive reforms, whether they are anti-corruption reforms or quality of governance reforms in bureaucracy uh, and, and so on. And I say the context is important because really when you look at the African context, then a priori, there are serious challenges in terms of how people come into power through very fraudulent uh, 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 electoral processes, replete with malpractices, you know, and therefore, uh, coming into power under those contexts, there is neither motivation uh, nor the political will to actually drive policies with regards to quality of government. And I think, therefore, that whereas the issue of addressing the quality of government is very, very important uh, in terms of good governance, which is uh, one definition of um, uh, uh, opposite of uh, corruption, which you discussed, I think is very, very important uh, to, to look at this. And I think in the kind of context that many African countries find themselves, a focus on electoral integrity to ensure the emergence of the right choices of people is a necessary precondition for the fight against corruption, for improving the quality of governance. And uh, I, I'm not saying it's not an either or situation, but it's in terms of what should be the priority of scholars you know, in terms of looking at these questions of whether to tame the beast, you know, or whether to, 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 uh, to look at how the beast achieves uh, uh, the objectives uh, of, of governance. The second issue which I want to uh, address uh, relates to the larger question of making sense of corruption, uh, which is really the impressive title of this book. Uh, I am not talking, and uh, I, I don't think there is African exceptionalism, but uh, I think how you make sense of the mind-boggling incidences of corruption in the African context, uh, particularly in the public sector, uh, 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 is, is, is really uh, something that needs to be carefully looked at uh, and addressed. And I'm not sure that a universal conception can help bring out or tease out the dynamics of it uh, in terms of that analysis being relevant to how to address the challenges that corruption poses in governance. I have many illustrations of this, and uh, perhaps there is no time uh, to, to discuss this. But you have a situation in which billions of dollars are diverted by ministers of government within a very short period of time. 
you know, and, uh, and there is no accountability, and you take them through the justice system, and it takes a lot of time. And indeed, because of the dynamics of politics in this diverse ethno-religious uh, context, uh, some of them become even heroes in their local communities, and they are branded as victims and the people who are being uh, victimized. And if I ask myself, how do you make sense of corruption in this kind of context? I think the issue of the role of colonialism uh, uh, has to be factored uh, in. Uh, there was a publication, I think, in the mid-70s, around 1975, by uh, Peter Ecke, uh, who uh, discussed what he called uh, colonialism and the two publics. And uh, uh, basically what he argued is that as a result of colonial rule, there are now two distinct publics in many post-colonial uh, contexts. You have the civic public, what he called the civic public, which emerged as a result of colonial rule, and which is basically the context of modern governance. And then you have what he calls the primordial public. And these two publics, as he argued, and there's a lot of sense in that, seem to operate on distinct moral premises, uh, such that um, you, you, it is the, the civic uh, public is more or less immoral in the sense that you can take resources, dip your hand in a till, and take money from the treasury, and it can be condoned and can be pardoned you know, uh, whereas if you did that in the primordial public, there is a conception of immorality which goes with punishment and even banishment uh, in those kinds of contexts. And that this notion uh, really, I think, seems to explain uh, the, uh, uh, um, the kind of mind-boggling incidences of corruption that we see and which makes it also difficult because it has to be taken into context in terms of designing what strategies are applicable in anti-corruption drives as well as in strengthening the quality of governance in many of these uh, third world countries. And that is why I felt, when I, uh, not just because I do some research on the question of electoral integrity, but that's why I think that is very, very important in these kinds of contexts. You know, if you are thinking of quality of government and you are thinking of using quality of government as the best way of addressing the uh, welfare issues and uh, the issues of justice uh, in a modern community, then obviously we have to take into consideration these contexts uh, which we struggle with and the dynamics of which really impose constraints in terms of dealing with corruption and bringing quality of government in our own countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mohammed. So, let me start by thanking you for inviting me here. As you know, this is a topic uh, which is quite close to uh, my heart. Um, and I, unfortunately, um, was only given a copy of the book this evening, so I haven't read the book. But let me just talk um, uh, from my own experience as a practitioner. I've had the privilege of working in um, more uh, corrupt areas than a lot of other people, uh, mainly in uh, the developing world, but also in the uh, developed world. And I will explain what I mean uh, in terms of the experiences that I have gained. Um, before we look at, in my view, the definition of corruption, and I will comment on that as well, I think it's very important to understand what are the underlying causes, for, uh, causes of corruption. Because once we have an understanding of the cause, then we can define the problem, then we can define it, the definition that needs to be applied to it, and then a lot of things flow from it. So Transparency International um, described the single biggest cause of corruption today is inequality. It's the difference between the rich and the poor, and that gap is getting wider and wider. In my experience in the countries that I have seen, corruption happens where the private sector 
ends up paying for its employees far more than the public sector and government pays. So if we want to address that issue, like there is in Singapore, that um, the, the, uh, the, the discrepancy between private pay and public pay has to be narrowed so as to make uh, uh, people all uh, earn the same amount of money for the same amount of work. Um, then there is the notion of uh, the culture in the country in question. There are many jurisdictions that we have worked in, like, say, the Middle East, where culturally it is expected that there is a system of um, enriching yourselves at the expense of the state. And that means that people that are working for royal family, for government, are intentionally paid nothing or paid low because the expectation is that they will make their percentage on any contract that um, is, entered, is entered into. There is then, I find, in countries like India, in Nepal, there is legislation that requires, more often than not, that a local partner has to become uh, a part of any business enterprise that you engage in. And that is a license for uh, problems. It's a license for um, state officials. It's a license for public officials to basically make money because these local partners can end up through fronting structures, um, fronting for, for people in power. Privatizations in the way that we uh, in the West um, have framed them, not in terms of how we do it in the West, but how we have advised privatizations to happen in many in developing uh, uh, parts of the world are also unfortunately a breeding ground for, for corruption. And so on, at the end of it, you know, we have to accept that it's the West that have by and large created a number of these structures. We have created the whole um, notion of having trusts and having um, you know, um, situations where the ultimate beneficial ownership of an asset can be hidden, although now we are moving towards more of a transparency uh, age, but there are still structures everywhere. We saw what happened in the Panama leaks. We saw what happened in the Bermuda leaks. We are the people who have invented this. Our lawyers have invented it. Our private wealth managers practice it. Um, and then when, when the West was dealing with this type of structures, it was very, very fine. Now when the developing world has started to make money and then they engage in wanting to create foundations and trusts, suddenly the whole game is over and we start to complain. Now let's look at the issues. I have come across in, in, in a lot of depth the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act of the United States. I have looked at the UK Briberies Act. I have looked at the Swedish Briberies Act. And first of all, when you look at that, you understand that these things are political um, uh, frameworks because nobody has really said, let's see if we can universally define a code that can apply to the developed world, that can apply in the developing world so that we stop forum shopping. Today, if I want to, I can devise a system where I can be compliant, say, under FCPA, non-compliant under the UK Bribery Act, and I've ticked my box because a facilitation payment under the FCPA is allowed. A facilitation payment under the UK Bribery Act will not be allowed. Okay? Then when you look at um, other issues, um, so is it possible to, to really have a definition of this? Should the definition be very precise or should it be uh, subjective and leave it to the, 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 the court and leave it to the system to be able to apply? The problem about having a definition that is too tight is only um, uh, going to allow lawyers to find a hundred ways um, around it. To have a definition that is very loose has its own problems because then people can say, well, it's a subjective sort of way of looking at this and this conduct by somebody doesn't quite fall within it. Um, and at the end of my little talk, I will describe a particular situation. I'm very happy that Bo and um, Aisha are here. They're both from Sweden and there is one particular case that I will touch on a little bit. So then we come to the question of extraterritoriality, which is very, very important. So the UK Bribery Act is, is probably the tightest I have seen because it doesn't matter 
whether um, you commit your uh, business or conduct yourself in an illegal way somewhere. If you are a British national or a British company that does it anywhere in the world, then basically you fall foul of the act. Um, what, the, what these acts also do not define is whether the payer of a bribe is worse than a recipient of the bribe. Um, and so one has to also understand who is supposed to be more responsible. Is the payer or the recipient? Most of these places we see um, it's the recipient who suddenly takes the bribe, that gets all the press, and the payer, by and large, if it's a Western corporation, knows how to defend itself. Um, and I fully agree with Professor Jagger that um, this whole concept depends on if a state is able to conduct, by and large, a free and fair election. If the free and fair election is untainted, the people who are elected in office have come without any baggage of any kind, then I think that the whole system uh, below it falls in a way that allows for people to conduct themselves um, without any uh, taint of corruption. Um, then when you look at the Yates Memorandum, so, so Sally Yates uh, was, the, um, was probably one of the smartest people in the U.S. Department of Justice. Unfortunately, um, she was appointed by Obama. Um, she was acting uh, Attorney General when she refused to endorse the first uh, Trump ban on Muslim countries. Trump fired her. But what she did in office through the Yates Memorandum, and for those of you that have not read it, I would encourage you to read it. It's a wonderful piece of work because it talks about um, how if you decide to go after corporations, you cannot only go after corporations, you need to go after the individuals. Because a corporate will be very happy to pay a big fine, and the people who are responsible for having the corporate behave in the way that they did get away scot-free. It also says in that memorandum that um, you should never settle a criminal case without settling the civil case and vice versa. And so in the US today, they've got a system, whether it will survive under Trump or not, I don't know. But under Obama, you had a system where the Department of Justice and the SEC cooperated very, very well to ensure that nothing fell between the cracks and each party was able to um, uh, get its fair share. Then we come to a situation, particularly in Sweden. So in Sweden, there is a, a, a case involving one of Sweden's largest telecom groups, Telia Sonera. And um, so the Swedish system is such that they were able to investigate a potential bribery case in Uzbekistan. However, under the Swedish code, they do not have the ability to find the Swedish company in a big way. They have the ability to jail individuals, but not to find the company. So the Swedish government has spent, as of now, 150 million Swedish kroners, $25 million, and the, all the findings they've had to hand over to the United States, which has then started to impose on Telia Sonera, on Wimplecom, on MTS, billions of dollars of fines. So the Swedes say, why are we doing the work at our taxpayer expense and somebody else is making money out of this? Now, the Swiss government found on this same case about $700 million sitting in a Swiss bank. So now there is a fight between the Swiss and the Americans. The Americans started their legal case and said we are entitled to this money. The Swiss say, sorry, this money is in our jurisdiction. We will have it. So until the authorities, first of all, have a definition, have a system that works for everybody, and have a common approach to prosecution, all of these things will take years and years and years to prosecute, will, cause, will, will, will cost the taxpayer a lot of money, and most likely at the end of it, unless you are the US DOJ and you have the muscle, nothing will come out of it. So I've said good things about the DOJ, but let me say one thing that I'm not very happy with. So in Telia Sonera's case, which you both know very well, the only reason why they got fined, or they will get fined, and Wimplecom got fined $850 million is because of two things. One is there was absolutely no crime committed in the United States. No U.S. investor, shareholder, taxpayer lost any money, but because U.S. dollars were the, the currency that was used and a U.S. domain name was the internet server that was used to 
agree transactions and wire money. It was on those two bases that the U.S. was able to establish jurisdiction and charge probably in this case alone close to $3 billion. You might ask, is that fair? Is that ethical? And if there was such a case, why should the money not go to Uzbekistan, whose citizens have been denied $3 billion of money that they should really have gotten in terms of what they sold the telecom licenses for? Those are my few observations. Thank you very much, Mohammed. So, a rich array. We've had the academic definitions explored and presented, and two fantastic sets of comments about where corruption actually occurs and hits the ground. Can I open up for your questions now? Annika. Thank you very much. Um, I've really appreciated the bridge between the scholars and the practitioners, so thank you. Um, in drawing on um, your take, very much looking at the private sector and what corruption means in that sphere, how do we link that into very much the definition that you're looking at, even when you look at the quality of government? Because if you look at the abuse of public office for private gain, we're still focusing on the public sector. And that goes to um, Professor Deja's point that maybe indeed an umbrella definition or an umbrella as such, would be sufficient to look at the context that we're looking at. What are your views in terms of trying to bridge the gap between what we're seeing in practice and the theory that's coming out? Thank Great. Or, or to be specific, um, Mohammed, do, does the, do the corruption cases that you've said arise because of gaps in the regulation of the public sector, or, you know, which is what Anik is asking? So um, most of the well-publicized cases um, that we read about are the public sector cases. Whenever government is in a position to sell something, that's when the problem happens, whether it is mining rights, whether it is telecom licenses, and a number of other things, privatizations, okay? But I believe, from what I have seen, that the problem is of a much bigger magnitude on the private side. It happens every single day, um, and because there is no real public oversight of that process, these things get unnoticed. And um, Professor Jager, in Nigeria, you talked about government corruption, but of course there's a lot of private sector corruption as well. Is it your belief that if you clean up the public sector, it will automatically follow that the private sector will clean up? Um, uh, to a large extent, that's the basis of my argument, that if you have elections with integrity and you have people who come in on that basis, rather than riding on the crest of uh, corruption and irregularities to get into government, then they are very likely to have the political will to address issues of corruption, not only in the sphere, in the public sphere, but also to be able to provide policies and regulations that can address challenges in the private sector. Mm -hmm. yeah. And is that the understanding that underpins your work, Boo and, and, and Aisha? Um, well, we actually discussed specifically what you were asking about when we were writing about this, why why just the public sector? Well, that's taxpayers' money. Citizens will demand accountability. But the private sector, do you care about what HSBC is doing if it's not tax money? Yeah? <laughs> um, and another, just to address what our discussants also brought up, the divide between the public and private sector, we, we address this at a very political theory level in the book about the dangers of just looking at one side and isolating the other. We highlight, we try to bring forth that we need to keep addressing the tension between the both. And only then can policies and theoretical movements ahead also follow. Thank you. Did you want to comment uh, as well? Just a small comment on context. Uh, uh, everyone says now that you, one size, size doesn't fit all and you have to know the context and, and uh, universal you know, policies doesn't work. We're not arguing for universal policies, but universal procedures. Think of democracy. It's a universal procedure, right? Not about policies. And I try to think of this as you do in, in medical practice. Now, if you ask doctors that you know about 
a problem you have, they really don't want to answer, even if they are your friends. Why? Because they say, I cannot really say anything about you, you, what you have until I have closely examined you and taken your tests. That doesn't mean they don't have universal knowledge. We don't have one theory of cancer per patient, right? But the, they know that there are treatments and drugs that in some cases have serious side effects because of the, some people are allergic against antibiotic drugs. Right? Now, the problem with all the people who speak about context, context, context is for me, you will end up with one theory of corruption per country or per city, or per village, or per individual, right? And then we lost, you know, so you have to balance. Of course, I realize that what we are presenting here is very universal. But I, of course, we are not writing out any recipes how that should be applied to the specific country, city, or village. Then you have to, using this universal knowledge, apply it with knowledge about the specific patient. Although with a caveat that Mohammed has highlighted, which is you don't want to open up forum shopping opportunities no, for individual no, companies. No. Now I'm going to move to the next question. Hi, I'm uh, John Lloyd. Um, and I wanted, I don't know if any of you have studied this, but it's a large element, a large discussion in my trade, which is journalism. Uh, and here in Oxford, where I work sometimes at the Reuters Institute, we have fellows from all over the, all over the world. Uh, and they speak about corruption in their countries. Um, and they say, as all journalists do, we try to hold power to account. Actually, uh, and they say that uh, in, in Africa, in India, China to an extent, um, journalists are holding power more to account than they did before. Yet, corruption in all of these countries is going up. And it's especially true of uh, Indian colleagues, Indian fellows, who say that the new news programs, very uh, aggressive interviewers, uh, are holding politicians to account. And right. that politicians may be uh, by, by the money that they get are getting more corrupt. Do you think that journalism does hold power to account in any country, developed or undeveloped? And, if you consider this, uh, have you considered journalism? Uh, corruption in journalism. Okay. Many of my colleagues say that, that most journalists in their developing countries, post-communist countries, are corrupt because of what Mohammed said earlier, they get no pay, therefore they've got to make it somehow. Thank you. And of course it's pointed out in the British context that the corruption by British politicians on their expenses was not exposed by the lobby journalists <coughs> whose corruption is that they get access if they if they report nicely about their subjects, but exposed by investigative journalists outside of Parliament. So even in this country, you could say that there's some quid pro quos going on. Cash for questions as well. Cash for questions. Cash for questions. So, but let's take the first part of that. Um, if any of you have an answer, can journalists help? Does the exposure of corruption by journalists, is that an important way to contain it? Now, think, comes, now comes the bad news. In, in the enormous data that our colleagues at the Varieties of Democracy Project have assembled, and that we also have assembled, this is what it shows. Democracy, I'm sorry to say, is not a safe cure against corruption. So many politicians who are exposed to, 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 to serious corruption are simply re-elected. And, and you can ask why, and, and we are trying to investigate this. But it's unfortunately not the case. And if you look at the simple shorts, the, the curve is U-shaped, you know. Uh, 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 the most corrupt countries are actually the newly, cor newly democratized ones. To, to take your questions about journalism, Jamaica is a fantastic case, you know. It has a really, really vibrant media situation. But it's one of the worst corrupt countries in the world. <laughs> It's exposed and exposed and exposed again that these guys get re-elected. Now, I'm all in favor of electoral integrity, but there is another way to think about electoral integrity. Electoral integrity, elections, I do not need to tell you this, is a very complicated administrative process. So without reasonably impartial 
election managers. The losing side will not accept the outcome. And if you actually look at the stable, if I am allowed to use the word elite democracies in Northwestern Europe, actually what they did was first to get systemic corruption under control. Then they became democracies. It was not the other way around. You first have to get sort of some trustworthy people who can count the votes, like you, and then you can get democracy. And one thing that it seems to be quite problematic in many countries is that newly elected governments seem not to be able to resist the temptation of using the public sector to reward their followers with jobs. If there would be an election today, tomorrow in Mexico, and there is a shift of government, 70,000 civil servants have to leave. The equivalent in Denmark is 26. So I have a, a comment, or two comments to make on your uh, observations. So firstly, let's look at the two um, very publicized cases. One of them is 1MDB in Malaysia. Everybody knows this case. Uh, the Wall Street Journal exposed this problem. And then my favorite one, Telia Sonera, it was Swedish investigative journalism that exposed this. So I think that it's very good for investigative journalism to be able to bring this out and expose it. But that's not the issue. The issue really is these two cases have exposed what is potentially billions of dollars of um, uh, corrupt deals. But then you go to the heart of it and you see, well, What's the definition of corruption? Has bribery actually taken place? Was there a wrongdoing that took place? And this is where both of these very well publicized situations are, are stalled. Nothing ever happens because when they look at the law as it is today, they look at the practice of this law as it is today, and they see that something that happened in Malaysia, well, what relevance does it have to the United States FCPA or the Swiss or the Swedish or wherever Singapore? Um, and it's very, very hard. So again, the journalists do their job, but the governments are, and the enforcement agencies are powerless to be able to do anything about it because of definitional issues and because of a, uh, a lack of common understanding. So this is one issue. The second point I would like to make, which we haven't touched on today, is when we talk of corruption, it's about the developing world. It's about emerging markets. But look at lobbying. You know, what is the fundamental difference in substance between a lobbying activity in the West that is regarded as legitimate? Washington and Brussels have hundreds, if not thousands, of lobbyists, okay? People who pay or support election campaigns obviously are not philanthropists. They are expecting something in return for this. So where do you actually draw the line? Why is it that lobbying is allowed and is legitimate and people accept it? Now, I realize that there are lots of safeguards that are built around the lobbying system. But in substance, the, the people from the developing world will argue it's no different. Professor Jager, can I ask you, you know, you, you did an extraordinary job of bringing integrity to the electoral process in Nigeria. So there was an election, there was a change in, 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 in leadership. What's the next necessary step to reduce corruption in Nigeria? Um, I, I think what is important is to, uh, first of all, sustain uh, that element of conduct of elections with integrity so that it does not become a one-off uh, a process, you know, but it becomes part of the culture, the political culture. And I think that's why I said uh, in Western European countries, you know, the issue of taming the beast is taken for granted because the issue of conducting elections was minimal, if any uh, electoral malpractices, uh, is taken for granted, you know, but you cannot compare that kind of context with what happened uh, when, when, when people manipulate results or buy results and come into power, whether in the legislature or in the executive arm of government, then there is very little motivation, you know, to either introduce policies or to have the political will to deal with even discovered and uh, 
uh, well-documented cases uh, of, of corruption. You know, so uh, I think in the Nigerian context, uh, we, we are beginning to uh, not only introduce, but see how the process of conducting elections with integrity can be sustained. And that's why I say in, a, in the general African context, you know, it is very important, whether in research or in advocacy, that we pay attention to that issue. Because you can see that in most African countries, most developing world, democracy is now the game in town. You know, but it's just the, the formal attributes of democracy, the substantive issues about democracy, of how people access power, you know, are, are really uh, are not being addressed because people really come into power uh, on the crest, as I said, of corruption. And that creates a remarkable constraint in terms of the scope for improving the quality of governance or dealing uh, with anti-corruption uh, issues. Look at uh, the media does a wonderful job, if I may take up a component of that question that has been raised, you know, in terms of exposing uh, corruption. In Nigeria, the media did quite well in terms of uh, uh, pointing in the direction of corruption by Minister of Petroleum, by the National Security Advisor of the previous regimes. And even more recently, uh, it's a whistleblower actually that did that, you know, they discovered $9.8 million in crisp dollars in a deep freezer, you know, in, in a shanty town that has been hidden by a former managing director of the National Petroleum Corporation. But the key issue is that while the media is contributing to the exposure and the information that the public now has about the extent and magnitude of corruption, there is no political will in the prosecution you know, of those. And why is it? Because virtually everybody uh, it's, it's in one way or the other interconnected, you know, in this uh, uh, labyrinth of uh, uh, corrupt uh, 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 processes. Mm -hmm. so, so really, uh, that issue of ensuring that the process that brings people to access power is relatively clean and ensures that those who are elected also now have to rely on people's choices rather than buying themselves through power goes a long way. As I said, it's not an either or thing, but it's in terms of looking at the context and seeing where the priority should be. Thank you. Mohammed, you were going to um, uh, ask you a question that you asked in a slightly different way because I think it's a very important question. So now here you have in Nigeria free and fair elections. You have a legitimately elected government with a head of state. If Nigeria was to say now that based on this now, let us enact a wide-ranging anti-bribery law, and you have the political will to be able to maybe hopefully push that, um, a la the UK Bribery Act, for example, um, and in that you say not only would Nigerians be punished for wrongdoing, but if a foreign corporation and its individuals were to start corrupting Nigerian companies and Nigerian individuals, then Nigeria, given its power, it's the largest economy in Africa, people want to invest in Nigeria, should also have the power to start to impose fines on foreign companies and foreign individuals. A, is this possible in Nigeria? And B, how do you think the world would react to this? I think there is a simple answer. At the moment, it's uh, really not possible, you know, but because the context, yeah, the context is still, uh, uh, I mean, we've just had the elections that brought a government, and the, the government itself it doesn't have a handle. It's overwhelmed in the fight uh, against corruption, you know. So, so obviously that is a challenge, and, uh, and how uh, uh, Nigeria operates in the larger international context is also a very important uh, consideration. You know, because you made a very good point about the, uh, um, you know, the, the, the individual country rules and regulations, uh, which are driven by national interests. You know, uh, so, so I think there are larger issues and constraints, and it's important to take all this on board in trying to understand uh, how to deal or to make sense of corruption. Terrific. Let me take the last two questions. I'll take them one after the other. So, Yankee, and then I'll come to you. Um, I, I was wondering with regards to the salience of, of having, uh, oh, I'm so sorry, with regards to have, 
with regards to the salience of, of having a universal or a global definition for corruption, I was wondering, what do you think are the main hurdles looking at the world order of, of present day? And also, is it a realistic proposition? And if we are close to it, how, how close are we to it? Great. So what are the obstacles to a global definition of corruption or a, a global rules around it? Uh, how effective is uh, development aid, DFID, etc., in, in combating uh, corruption? So how effective is development aid in combating corruption? So two questions, beautifully short, thank you. Was there any other last question? No? That, well, okay, one more, so long as it's beautifully short, like the last. <laughs> Can we, can um, it's very interesting that you tried to turn the whole thing on, the, on its head initially and try and define what is the opposite to corruption. So did you take that further in your book and did you find a state that fitted that particular description and would it be better to study that state in order to learn from that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me, should I? Yes, why don't you answer that one I just can briefly? quickly answer all of them. There is actually a UN convention against corruption. It's not perfect, but it's quite good, and it has been rat rectified? Ratified. ratified by 170 countries. People don't know anything about it. It's unknown. But that was also the case with the UN Declaration for Human Rights for three decades. Nobody paid attention to it. And then when the Soviet leaders signed the Helsinki Declaration, they didn't understand they were signing the death sentence, right? People were starting holding. So the same, this is the argument I shall try to make. It's not inconceivable that people will make this connection. The answer to you is simple, no. Uh, there is uh, several reports, one by Robert Klitgott for OECD, saying that the, the billions of dollars spent the last 20 years by the World Bank and many others on, on uh, anti-corruption campaigns, the result is zero. Uh, and we think it's for two reasons that we address in this book, a bad definition and a lousy theory of the problem. <coughs> this is exactly the question we got when I started in this research some 12 years years ago. We invited Danny Kaufman, who was then the chief economist at the World Bank, and uh, he was the one who basically drove the World Bank's good governance project. And uh, he said to us, I think it was in 2005 or six. he said, no, 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 Boo, you shouldn't study corruption. We know everything we need to know about corruption. What I really want to know is how come those countries up here in the north, uh, the Nordic countries, with their gigantic budgets and big bureaucracies and so, why have they not fallen completely down in corruption? Because according to his theory, they should. So that is one thing we have done, yeah, try to uh, study how come West, Northwestern European countries ever managed to get out. I mean, there is no corruption-free country, but out of systemic corruption, yes. That is how it started. You know. Great. Um, Aisha, did you have anything to add yes, on that, any I, of those? I wanted to add to Mohammed's earlier thing, what you were wondering about. Who do you punish, in the bribe giver or the bribe taker? And uh, the, EC, the EU legislation actually looks at that very closely. And uh, there's a great example we bring in into the book. And it's about a concentration camp. And if a person who is in a concentration camp wants to bribe his way, bribe the prison guard to get out. Should he then be held liable or that guard for accepting that bribe? He knows that he can take this bribe and let this man free because otherwise this man is going to die. So is either party here punishable? And there's a, we also speak about so this. the um, difference between legality and morality. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And, and there, there's, in the book, <laughs> when you get the time to read it. Uh, there is another, there are classifications of types of bribe, exactly what you were bringing up. What, what type of bribe and what type of giver and what type of recipient. recipient and different situations that are described. And again, going back to Islamic political theory, there is a very short exposition, a one-page exposition 
describing these different types of situations. And just finally, the, I don't know if you've read this, but the Australian Act on Corruption, the, the, their entire l legislation around it, is probably the most wide but also stringent. You, you'd yeah. enjoy reading that. Okay, thank yes. you very much. Can I, can I <laughs> ask, in closing, Mohammed and Atihiru, each of you, there is a global convention. Um, is there more to be done on that level? And if development aid is so hopeless at reducing any kind of corruption, what, you know, is there something that globally should be done? A lot of people in this room are part of efforts to try to contain corruption at the international level, at the national level, in NGOs. What is it that they should be directing their efforts to? So just a line from each of you, yeah, if I might. Oh, so I have um, a couple of points to make. I think development aid never really helps solve corruption problems, but probably encourages corruption to happen. Because when you see hundreds of millions of dollars flowing into a country, and unless you can have the more stringent structures to police how that money is going to be spent, and by whom, and under what structures, it's a license for uh, a lot of people to get involved and probably, I don't know what the statistic is, but I vaguely recall 20 or 30 percent of it is um, hijacked into, um, into areas that should not, uh, should not be touched. But Mohammed, if you do really stringent controls, you just end up spending half your aid budget on PricewaterhouseCoopers to audit it. Um, so it's not PricewaterhouseCoopers that, um, that I would... Um, so just as we have um, peacekeeping forces mm -hmm. that the UN can send out mm -hmm. to countries, just as we have soldiers who go out and police things, there are also people who are mm -hmm. probably able to under the right sort of regime. Mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting for one minute that we pay lawyers and accountants to go and spend thousand pounds an hour auditing this stuff. It's not about audits. It's not about paper trails. It's about the reality on the ground. So that's one issue. The second issue is Look, whenever there has been a pressing problem, like I, I, I use the example of the Sustainable Development Goals, because to me this is like reading poetry. 195 countries of the world came together, identified 18 goals on which the language, the substance, the form was all agreed. Climate change took, I don't know, Paris took 14 years to get there after Kyoto and all these places, but they finally got there. If we want the world to be tackling corruption systemically. I think that the will should be there to look at the convention that is in place, modify it to the extent it's needed, and then try and get people in their local countries to try and legislate to put that into, um, into law. And the law has to be the same everywhere to stop forum shopping. There has to be a body that can help interpret this law so that its application is uniform. Otherwise you get into a situation where one court says, sorry, but we don't think it is, and another court says we think it is, and then precedent sets in and you go where it is easy and not where that's difficult. Professor Jagel, the last yes, word I, to you. I, I definitely agree that uh, development aid has not helped um, uh, as it should. Um, um, uh, but uh, on the global convention, uh, uh, I, I think that is good that there is a global convention. And uh, what needs to be done, it's rather than wait 30 years like we've done on the Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights, we must find ways and the means of uh, not only uh, getting a general sensitization and the enlightenment about it, but also engaging some credible civil society organizations that can push for the domestication of these conventions and compliance, particularly in many of the third world countries. And uh, uh, the extent to which some of these international conventions are domesticated gives a good framework for many credible civil society organizations to pursue advocacy and to put pressure and to organize collective action. Uh, to drive uh, 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 the actualization of these uh, visions. Well, thank you for ending on a positive note about what can be done. Can you all join me in thanking the panelists for such a fan fantastic discussion? <laughs> and I'd like to invite you all to join us for, I think, some drinks in the bribe, forum. Bribe. Not a bribe, but a chance to speak to our experts in person. Thank you. Thank you so much.
so much. Yeah, thank you. It's, no, frankly, it's fantastic.